to the third world. Well, one aspect of that is the kind of privatization which uh, leaves power in the hands of usually foreign industry or their local counterparts. We've just seen it go on in Mexico. Mexico's had the biggest privatization in modern history in the last, you know, actually the biggest privatization in history probably is the internet and the whole telecommunication system. Here is a system developed uh, at public expense which is being given, you know, it's not even sold. It's not even, it's not privatization, sometimes they sell it for something. Here we just give it away, you know, to private power. So that's huge privatization. But in third world countries, I suppose the main case is Mexico. And in fact, yeah, it's true, the Mexican telephone company and so on, they're getting privatized. Uh, and you're getting a small couple hundred billionaires, you know, service isn't improving except for the rich, getting a small number of billionaires. Uh, wages and incomes have collapsed by, you know, can't say a measure, but maybe 50% during the liberalization period. Um, in 1995, right after the collapse, uh, GNP went down by about 8 or 9%, still not recovering. Yeah, that's privatization. On the other hand, sometimes it might be the right thing to do. You know, like maybe it would be, but you need an argument. And the argument's complicated. The, the principle that says it's a wonderful thing, always do it, that's just, you know, that's not even religion. That's just pure doctrine. It's kind of like Stalinist doctrine. There's no reason to believe it. Sometimes it might be right. Sometimes it might be wrong. Something and right or wrong don't have uh, don't mean anything either. Something can be right for some people and wrong for other people. Yeah, that's right. Uh, no, not to eradicate. Well, see, the World Bank gives you two contradictory. Take a look at World Bank programs. They have two contradictory messages, totally contradictory. On the one hand, the World Bank does say consistently and forcefully that the path to economic growth requires relative equality, uh, human capital, you know, so improving health and education and so on, improving infrastructure and relative equality. Those are the primary factors that are involved in growth. That's one side of their mouths. With the other side of their mouths, they're imposing policies which bar all of those things. So structural, whatever, you, you may like structural adjustment or hate it, but nobody doubts that what it does is reduce expenditures for health and welfare, increase inequality, cut back infrastructure, in fact, undermine exactly the factors that the World Bank and the other side of its mouth says are necessary for growth. And privatization is part of that. Uh, simply ask yourself a question. Who get, you know, whatever debates you can have about privatization, there is one group of people that definitely gain by it, namely the people who are picking up the pieces. Okay. Well, they happen to be the same people who are making the policies. That should at least cause some question to arise. Uh, yeah, I want to make a comment on that. I am from Mexico, and, uh, well, perhaps it's not statistically significant, but uh, prior to the privatization of Telmex, you get a phone line, you could wait for two years. That's right. And now you don't have to. And now it's much faster. Right now you order a phone line. Within 24 hours, they give us a phone line. <laughs> Who? Who? Or anyone. Yeah, anyone, except that for 95% of the population, it's out of the question. Well, Mexico has more phone lines now than ever. Yeah, that's right. It has, more, has, it, has a, it has a rich sector which is being well provided. But, for, but public phones, that's I'm not happening. I, I worked this summer in, in the government state, and you can see all the poor people living in the very, I, I went like in, in high school, I went to the Sierra, mm -hmm. I had to walk there. Now they have homes. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't buy that argument. I also don't buy the argument it's, it's, of, of, of uh, not helping. Not, not, not helping GDP, who? Mexico's GDP last year, 34% went to exports. <coughs> Exports, the economy would be really collapsed. Yeah, that's right. So many mm. uh, so I, I uh, but hold, but let's take a close look. Okay. Yes, exports increased to pay up, mostly to pay off the debt. You know, for most of the population, take a look at what's happened. For most of the population, for in fact, average wages 
have declined quite radically. It depends exactly how you measure, but roughly in the 50 percent range declined since the liberalization began. Malnutrition has gone way up. Uh, starvation has gone up. Millions of people have driven have been driven off the land because they've been undercut by subsidized U.S. agro-exports. There is production in regions which are in the Maquila regions primarily, uh, which are, have virtually no linkage to the Mexican economy. They don't use Mexican inputs. Uh, they don't. Uh, the about the only thing that they contribute to the Mexican economy is whatever the wages are. Uh, environmental conditions have gotten much worse, but for a sector of the uh, population, you know, the wealthier sector, surely things are better. That's true of every third world country. You go to sub-Saharan Africa, the same thing is true. There's a sector of the population that lives extremely well, in fact, that lives by Western standards, and there's a large mass of the population which is somewhere between suffering and misery. And for the wealthier part of the, sec of the population, there is no doubt that these policies improve things. It's the same everywhere. For that part of the population, yes, these policies improve things. Uh, when you say that Mexican, uh, Mexico is living off exports, that's true. Uh, on the other hand, the growth, uh, the growth rate in Mexico is much faster prior to 1980. It's declined since then. And you have to ask yourself what alternative policies are not being followed, okay? Of course, there's always improvement. You know, things always, uh, there's, there's always technical improvement, there's always more phones, there's always, you know, more airplanes and so on. What you have to ask yourself is, what are the net effects of carrying out this specific form of change? Well, it has varied effects for different parts of the population. I agree, it certainly has improved things for the wealthier sector, and it's harmed things for the, for the majority. Well, I could, I could say uh, what I saw is, uh, in one state where I live, mm. in this last year, half a million people that didn't get drinkable water are getting it for the first time. It's a state of four million people. So uh, who are they getting it from? Biggest increase. Mm. And also, you are going to get the first city in Mexico with a, like a treatment of water. So pollution yeah. is going down. No, it's going I up, know. actually. The the all over all Mexico, it's going up. Excuse me. Go ahead. Were you, you weren't talking about Mexico City, were you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, the, with Mexico City, it's true, the opposition won. But, uh, you know, you'll find places where there are, things are getting better. You find other places where they're getting worse. On the average, they're getting worse. Uh, and that's particularly striking when you compare the development of Mexico up till 1980 when it was, in fact, a rapid growth period, just, in fact, very much the same as East Asia. So, yeah, it separates. Uh, but uh, f for people like us, you know, yeah, m in most of the third world, people like us live very well. Uh, most of the population are like the ones in Roxbury. They don't. And for them, it's getting worse. Uh, now, look, I, in the case of, say, privatization of the Mexican telephone I think you have to look at, at it on its own. You have to look at what the consequences were. Of course, it's an attack on democracy. That's by definition any kind of privatization is. But sometimes it could be that an attack on democracy is beneficial to people, and sometimes it might not be. You have to look closely and see what happened, where resources went, what the alternatives were, uh, you know, what people are paying for it, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's what you have to look at. The same is true when you look at, say, deep death tech right here, deregulation of, of airlines. Is it beneficial or not beneficial? Well, actually, there's been quite a big debate about that. I mean, it's true that uh, airplanes are faster, and there are more of them, and they're safer, but that was going on before deregulation. So what you have to show is that there was a, there's a point of inflection, you know, that things and in fact, what you find is, yeah, there were changes, but they're in all directions. So, so one, of the, one of the changes, for example, is that the number of heart attacks has gone way up uh, because people are now cram crammed into such close quarters that they end up with uh, embolisms. Uh, another is that uh, um, the cheapest way to get from Boston to Washington is probably through London uh, because of the way they privatized air 
affairs work out. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, there's all kinds of changes, and you really have to measure them all. Um, and uh, some of them are very hard to measure. So, for example, one change which shows up in the statistics as an improvement uh, is automation of uh, services in the airlines. It's so, like you call an airline office, you know, and it get, you, you get into an automated menu. And, you know, ultimately, if you work through it, you, if you're lucky, you get what you want. Uh, that saves money. That makes the airlines much more efficient because they don't have to pay human beings to sit there and answer your, your, what you're saying, right? So when an economist looks at it, they say, yeah, a lot more efficient than it used to be. But that's because of the ideological technique of measurement. They're not measuring what it costs you, you know, the person who's calling up, to sit there for half an hour while you sort of wait for, you know, to get onto the computer and then to start pushing the buttons, which you don't understand, and they don't have your answer anyway, uh, and uh, so on. Well, that's a cost to a person. The cost to people, to users, is multiplied by the number of users. Well, it could be a substantial cost, maybe small to each person, but huge when you multiply it by the number of users. But it's unmeasured. The only thing that is measured uh, is the increase of efficiency in the airlines, which shows up in their cost. So yeah, it looks good. Well, those are things you really have to take into account, and they're not small. I mean, uh, there have been few attempts to study them. It's not a popular topic. Uh, but there have been a few attempts to study, for example, the cost of highway repairs as compared of, of, of uh, repair of cars. Well, the few, st few studies are around seem to indicate that the cost of repairing highways is considerably lower than the total cost of repairing cars because of uh, hitting potholes and so on. But the second cost is not counted. It's only the first cost that's counted. The first cost is a cost of the inefficiency of government spending money on, you know, on highways. The second cost is distributed over the population. And in fact, if you really look closely, the second cost turns out to be an improvement in GNP. Because if your car hits a rut and you have to take it to the garage to get fixed, the GNP goes up. So it's actually an improvement in the economy uh, when the costs are transferred over to individuals. There's a lot of that that goes on. And all of those things would have to be taken into account if we were giving an honest, accurate description of these effects. On the other hand, in Mexico, I think if you look closely, you'll find that the gross effects are not in doubt. Uh, there has been a very sharp decline in living standards for the majority of the population. And uh, uh, in many areas, a dangerous increase in pollution, especially around the Maquiladora areas. Uh, there are places where doubtless things have improved for some people, as they had been doing before, and we have to know, we have to evaluate all of these effects. As to the effect of NAFTA, it was probably very limited. It's now conceded that the, if you take a look at the trade flows before and after NAFTA, trade did go up after NAFTA, but at roughly the rate it was going up before. There's very little change. And that's now conceded. All the projections are now admitted to have been false. And what is said right in the mainstream is, yeah, the purpose of NAFTA was to lock Mexico into the reforms. In fact, let me add something else which is less public. Uh, this was discussed in strategy sessions in Washington earlier, uh, the minutes of which are public. Uh, there was a major meeting in Washington in 1990 of top decision makers and Mexico specialists and so on, uh, talking about U.S.-Mexico relations. And they decided that relations were very healthy and very good, with, but there was one cloud on the horizon. The cloud was, I'm quoting it now, that a democracy opening in Mexico might bring into power a government with more nationalist and populist goals. Okay. Well, NAFTA stopped that. The main effect of NAFTA has not been increasing trade, but it's been decreasing the danger that a democracy opening might lead to that. So they can uh, pick, uh, say, populist leaders in Mexico City, but the virtual Senate uh, of international investors under NAFTA-style arrangements ensures that they can't do very much, so there isn't any fear of a democracy opening. My own view is that's the main thing to lay behind NAFTA, as the World Trade Organization, as the coming agreement.
person who's got a PhD in linguistics be interested in poor people? I don't even understand that question. I mean, does taking a degree in linguistics remove your humanity? I mean, I hope not. You, know, you shouldn't believe me. You should certainly not believe a word I said. That's why I was giving sources. Look them up. You shouldn't believe me or anyone else. It may, yeah, but I, you know, it, it, it may, but it shouldn't, yeah. Fifty-five billion to open up Korea to foreign ownership. Yeah, actually, but just in terms of scale, the bailout for Korea is not all that big. I mean, let's compare it with what's done here, see. Uh, the bailout of the S SNLs, which is one minuscule, insignificant part of the U.S. economy, was four times the bailout of Korea. That's the biggest socialization in modern history, was the taking the SNLs, which are like, you know, you know it's, it's not like a central core piece of the U.S. economy. There's little banks that are, you know, giving out real estate mortgages. Uh, bailing them out, uh, meaning bailing them out, means bail bailing out wealthy investors who made bad loans and investments. Uh, that uh, came a conservative estimate of that is about $200 billion. That was just distributed over U.S. taxpayers because part of the system is that cost and risk are socialized. Okay, uh, and uh, that that alone, that little piece, is four times Korea. Well, what's happening in South Korea? Take, uh, uh, yesterday's New York Times had pretty good discussion of it on the business pages, not on the front pages. If you look in the business pages, there was a pretty good discussion, and what they pointed out was, yeah, the bailout is a bailout of uh, mostly foreign investors and foreign banks, and uh, you know, wealthy Koreans who made bad loans. In fact, the chief economist of the World Bank, Joseph Stiglitz, was quoted as saying, as being very much opposed to this, because what he's saying is all it's doing is telling investors there's no risk. Uh, so if they want to, you know, lend money with a chancy investment, well, you know, if it works, they make a lot of money. If they lose, it gets socialized. So it, it, the, remember that these are socialized. What the bailout, so-called bailout of South Korea, means you're paying for it, right? Even the stuff that comes from the World Bank is coming from taxpayers. So all of this stuff is being socialized, just like the third world debt was, uh, to make sure that uh, uh, rich people don't have to face risks. And in fact, the you know the chief economist of the World Bank was just quoted on that yesterday. Uh, jo uh, Jeffrey Sachs from Harvard, who's a big advocate of all this stuff, was also quoted saying the same thing. He's saying these were failures of private markets. It has nothing to do with governments. These were failures in private markets, and now the public is being called upon to pay them off with the condition, crucial condition that you mentioned, and that's very crucial. South Korea now has to agree to abandon the system, which led to its phenomenal growth. South Korean growth rates have really been phenomenal, like nothing in the West. Uh, and they were done under a highly regulated state-centered system. Uh, as soon as they began to liberalize their financial institutions, they immediately started getting into trouble, just like Latin America. Uh, and now they are supposed to go the Latin American direction, sell out their resources, make, let foreigners own their industry, you know, let foreign banks decide what the social policy is going to be, cut down on wages, you know, cut, cut back on security of employment. Yeah, that's what they're supposed to do in return for the public socializing the debts of the bad, paying off the bad debts of uh, rich people. That's what it comes down to. But quite apart from what it amounts to, even the scale isn't so huge. As I say, it's about a quarter of the SNL. And that's a small part of the socialization of risk that goes on in the United States. Actually, it's not just the United States. There's a, the best study I know of, the only detailed study of transnationals by two British economists, uh, investigated the top 100 transnationals in the fortune list, you know, ranking them. And, you know, a long detailed analysis, they concluded that the top 100, uh, every single one of them, first of all, they concluded that almost none of them were transnationals. They were based in a particular country, and that's where their markets were, and that's what they relied on for 
you know, subsidy and so on. Uh, they also concluded that, of, that every one of the top 100 had benefited from state industrial policy in its own home country, and that more than 20 out of the 100 would not exist as business enterprises if it hadn't been for bailout uh, by the home country. That incidentally includes Newt Gingrich's favorite, Lockheed which was bailed out by a $2 billion loan guarantee when they started getting into trouble. So nothing special about South Korea, except that it's, a, it's another form of socialization of risk and is being used as a lever uh, to turn it into Mexico. Can't hear. Iran? internally in Iran. Well, Iran did have a democratic opening back in the early 1950s, and they elected a conservative, conservative nationalist government, the Mossadegh government. That was overthrown by a U.S.-British military coup, put into power the Shah, who ruled the country in a very brutal fashion for up till 1979, but incidentally with economic growth. You know, it's another one of those uh, brutal dictators who, for part of the population, was producing substantial growth and modernization. He was considered a great hero in the West. Uh, when he was overthrown, well, you got the Khomeini Revolution, and it's, which, you know, was very dictatorial and, you know, religious. I'm, I'm sure you're probably Iranian, I guess. Yeah, so you know ten times as much about this as me, so there's no point in my talking about it. But, uh, I mean, that's been somewhat eroding. And I think there's now a lot of um, unpredictable, well, you tell, you, you tell me, but it, my feeling is there's a lot of unpredictable currents going in different directions in Iran, which uh, could, are opening up the society. And so the society itself is much less fundamentalist than others that, like, say, Saudi Arabia. In fact, in many ways, it's less fundamentalist than the United States. The United States is one of the most religious fundamentalist countries in the world, you know. Uh, but... Uh, uh, they have a kind of clout, the religious authorities there that they don't have here. But I, I, I think, I think, well, what, I'm interested in hearing what you say. But to me, it looks like it's eroding. Yeah. But there's just a lot of things happening in the society. You know, there's a lot of cross currents. There's uh, independence. You know, you see people. I see you see people publishing all kind of things you wouldn't believe, and so on. Uh, exactly where Iran's going to fit into the world system is a tricky story. The United States is trying very hard to isolate it, the United States and Israel, but they're alone in that. The United States and Israel are alone in trying to isolate Iran right now, and that, it doesn't look like they're getting away with it. Other countries are just, you know, breaking the rules. Can I take freedom? One more? Yeah, yeah, one more. No, freedom goes to leave. Just one more question. Well, maybe you could comment on the Harvard guidance privatization of the former Soviet Union. Well, uh, the system was set up in such a way, and the Soviet Union was is the original third world. You know, that goes back to the 15th century. You go back to the 15th century, uh, Eastern and Western Europe were sort of alike, and they started separating. The West began developing. The East became its service area. Uh, and the gap between the East and the West grew right up into early this century. So the largest gap between the East and the West was around 1910. You know, it just kept going up until then. Well, in Eastern Europe was a deeply impoverished peasant society. It had sectors of wealth, mostly Western connected. It had, you know, artists and writers and, you know, an aristocracy who talked French and all the stuff we read about when, you know, we study Russian history. But it had a huge mass of people who were living in total misery, you know, and backwardness. Well, you know, the Bolshevik Revolution was, I don't think it had a thing to do with socialism or, or certainly not democracy, but it was a revolution of forced industrialization. And it carried out a quite brutal policy of forced industrialization, which turned the Soviet Union into a modern society. It's not third world. That's going back to third world. But through the 1980s, it was not a third world society. If you compare it with comparable, more or less comparable societies that we were running looks pretty good. 
So compare the Soviet Union with Brazil, let's say, another big country with a lot of resources, you know, no enemies in that case, very much run by Western power, first the British, then us. Um, for 10% of the population of Brazil, it's way better than living in the Soviet Union. For probably 90%, it's much worse than living in the Soviet Union. You know, in fact, if you look at their social indicators, they're about the level of Albania. You know. uh, well, okay, so the Soviet Union became a modern industrial society. Uh, mid eight, there were things, it was beginning to stagnate around the 1960s for all kinds of reasons, uh, which people debate. By the 1980s, it was still, the growth rate was going up, you know, still functioning. The uh, upper classes in the Soviet Union, which is the state bureaucracy, you know, totalitarian state, it was run by a state bureaucracy, they essentially made the decision to uh, dismantle it, uh, concluding, probably accurately for themselves, uh, that they could do much better being like the wealthy sector in Mexico than being like the wealthy sector in Russia. They themselves could be. So they return, essentially are returning the society to its third world status, meaning a sector of very great wealth, most of them old Communist Party apparatchiks, just like Yeltsin, you know, uh, who essentially sold off the system. Uh, they are now becoming extremely wealthy, a kind of a mixture of the old state bureaucracy and new criminal elements and so on and so forth. Well, there's a huge flow of capital from Russia to the West. Capital flight is extraordinary. I mean, nobody knows exactly how to estimate it, but it's considered to be a, a measurable part of U.S. national income now, it's just capital flight from Russia, just like Mexico and Brazil and other countries where the rich people are free to you know, make money by selling off the resources or, and, uh, and then sending their money to the West. Uh, most of the countries, the, for most of the population, it's been very harsh. Uh, uh, there's a, by 1993, there were already estimated by the West, by Western sources, to be about a half a million extra deaths a year, just as a result of the economic reforms, which the West approves of. It's fairly substantial, you know, uh, and so on across the board. I mean, very moving to a typical third world pattern. Uh, what is the Western role in this? Well, to implement it. You know? Yeah, of course. I mean, Western investors are very happy to see it go back to that. Uh, you can uh, put a, uh, you know, a, a, a Volkswagen or General Motors or a Fiat and so on can uh, put up an assembly plant in former Eastern Europe at a fraction of the cost of uh, what it costs for what the, the business press is quite frank about this. They say you can put up, I'm quoting, you can put up factories there for a fraction of the cost of what you have to pay the pampered Western workers. Yeah, that's true. You don't, have to pay, you don't have to pay them anything like what you pay the pampered Western workers, just the same as when you shift the assembly plant from Indiana to uh, northern Mexico. You know? yeah. uh, and that's great for Western investors. Uh, it has the usual effects on the, on the recipient society, you know, divides it into a sector of wealth, a large number of people who sort of get by if they can, superfluous people. Uh, and yes, the West has implemented it. The specific programs that were developed, say, Sachs's program, also were designed to break up the interactions among the Soviet, the Eastern, the countries of the Soviet system. You know, they had all kind of economic, it was a closed economic system. And the idea was to set up what was called a hub and spoke system. So each Eastern European country would have independent relations with the West, not with one another. And the early effect of that was a very serious attack on the whole economic system. That's incidentally now rebuilding. Those links are coming back to some extent. But the, uh, essentially it was subjected to the same kinds of neoliberal structural adjustment programs as Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa with pretty similar effects. Again, you have to disaggregate. I mean, this Eastern Europe was not a homogeneous area. Parts of it were part of the West, like, say, the Czech Republic. And that was a rich Western industrial society. And it'll, with various, you know, failures and so on, it'll probably move back to that. Same true of Western Poland, which is really part of Germany. Uh, but, and, you know, Estonia will become part of Finland, you know, a rich industrial society. But by and large, it's more or less restoring what it was before the uh, move towards independence.